Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Blueberry Hill and the Del Mar Loop. Everybody feels welcome here. I can't even imagine not having them in my life. Lots of people making small efforts leading to big results. Today on Spotlight, meet a photographer who sold everything and traveled the world to find his passion. Plus, a WashU study is researching a blood test that could detect Alzheimer's. And then calling attention to the need for climate change with artwork. But first, Blueberry Hill celebrates a big birthday this year. The story behind this St. Louis staple. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. The Del Mar Loop has been voted one of the 10 best streets in America. And for the past 50 years, its front door has been Blueberry Hill. It's essentially cheers for you city. And the couple who started it all was Joe and Linda Edwards, who built the restaurant on $10,500 of money borrowed from friends. I started it because I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. And I figured, well, I'm gonna to try to open a place where people could gather and enjoy themselves, where I could program the jukebox with my record collection of 30,000 45 RPM records and change every single song every two weeks, except for Blueberry Hill, of course. When the restaurant opened in 1972, the Del Mar Loop had gone from thriving business district to rack and ruin, making the early days at Blueberry Hill an uphill battle. U City was so skeptical of a long haired hippie opening a restaurant, at first it refused to grant Edwards a liquor license. Eventually, though, the city gave in. Edwards got his license, kept his ponytail, and hired lots of other people with ponytails. The first two years, I didn't know if we were going to make it. And we almost went out of business three times in those first two years, mainly because I banned for life two thirds of our customers. I was not going to deal with the rude people that would say rude things to strangers they didn't know. I wasn't going to deal with the drug dealers or the so-and-so that were frequent in the area. And when they got out of hand, it was just, okay, you're banned for life. Oh, you can't do that. Yeah, I can. Some better behaved patrons have become customers for life. Tracy Moore started coming here when she was just eight years old. You can't not come. There is like a thing about it where it's, you feel home. There's like an authentic feel of this place where it's not forced. It's not some kitschy place that has, you know, things on the wall that are fake. First time I came in here, I mean, I just, you just look around and like when I bring people in here, you can't take it all in, in one sitting. Over five decades, Blueberry Hill's shoe size has greatly grown. What started in just two rooms today has a footprint of 10 rooms, covering an entire city block. Becca Schock came here 30 years ago, looking for a job as a dishwasher. Within five years, she was made general manager, but she doesn't work behind the scenes. She works behind the bar. There's a bunch of people that come here every single day, and the people that they hang out with, I'm sure are quite different than the people that they would have been hanging out with and meeting in other parts of their life. You know, I hope I don't die anytime soon, but I think that the people that might attend my memorial will be a real strange group of people, you know? <laughs> the most eclectic group of people frequenting Blueberry Hill may be the musicians who have played here. Blueberry Hill has long been a friend to local talent and for some performers, a stepping stone to stardom. And then, of course, there was the residency of the biggest star of all, Chuck Berry, the father of rock and roll, who performed 209 monthly concerts in the Duck Room. Chuck Berry being here was just so special. And I don't even know if people realize how important he was to music into the St. Louis area. But I just cherish the memories of seeing him. He was always there at 10 o'clock. He might be there two hours early or one minute before, but he always showed up 
and just played his heart out. He loved performing at Blueberry Hill. Just as Chuck Berry helped put Blueberry Hill on the map, Blueberry Hill helped put the Del Mar Loop on the map. The success of the restaurant propelled Joe Edwards to work his way down the block, saving old places like the Tivoli Theater and building new places like the Moonrise Hotel. Edwards also created the St. Louis Walk of Fame, rivaled in star power by his own Walls of Fame inside Blueberry Hill. But the real stars are the everyday customers who think of the staff as family and the place as home. My mom turned 80. She wanted a Budweiser and she wanted a burger from Blueberry Hill. So for her 80th birthday, that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to have a little party at Blueberry Hill. You know, people would say like, well, didn't she want to go somewhere fancy? And like, no, she wants to go to Blueberry Hill. Like that's her thing. She passed away in January and her birthday is coming up and we're gonna come and have an honorary burger and beer for her. In the late 1970s, people came in just assuming since they had big money, we're buying it. And I said, well, no, you're not. <laughs> they said, right, we're gonna do it. We're gonna put one in Denver. We're gonna put one so-and-so. I said, no, you're not. You, you can do whatever you want with your own places. You're not touching Blueberry Hill and the Del Mar Loop. This is, this is a one of a kind, get out. Opening a restaurant in a rundown area of town in 1972 may have seemed like a moonshot. But for Joe Edwards, well, that's kind of his thing. What I try to do is create one-of-a-kind places where people can put their troubles behind them for like two or three hours and enjoy life. Everybody feels welcome here. Blueberry Hill is holding a special anniversary celebration on September the 8th. For more information, head to blueberryhill.com. HEC Media recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Mark your calendars for the 2022 St. Louis Art Fair, taking place September 9th through the 11th. Go behind the art with HEC Media's Meet the Artist series at youtube.com slash meet the artists. I spent the last 15 years traveling and, and focusing on a lot of different cultures around the world. I focused on the southern tribes of southern Ethiopia, pilgrims at Kumba Mela, the Zapotecs in Oaxaca, a lot of different cultures. I really find it fascinating to be able to bring to awareness some of the ways of others, some of the ways of being that other people have around the world. You know, the way that I got into photography um, is really a, a long story. I love to share it, but in short, I was a technology sales rep for about 15 years and I kind of went through a personal valley of darkness. I sold it all and traveled around the world for one year. I came back with a portfolio of work that sort of led me into this new direction. And then five years later, National Geographic uh, discovered the work. I hope the work that I create will help others sort of have empathy and compassion and understanding and embrace the differences that these other peoples have. What I photograph is so much different than how I live. I'm inspired by it. I love to connect with people who are not like me. I try to connect with people that don't think the way I think, that don't live the way that I live. And I find that if I can bring that into these exhibitions and these shows, uh, hopefully I can express with the work that this is something to be admired and to be embraced. When I first started out, I was in the mountains of Vietnam and I came across a woman in the mountains, me and her, uh, and she passed me and she had a blue and a green hand and I stopped her and ask her what was on her hands. And from the dye, from the indigo dyes, one blue, one green hand, I stopped her and, and asked her to present her hands to me and hold them out. And I photographed one picture, didn't think anything about it. 
I had no idea the impact that, that one image would have on my personal career as well as the people who now collect that piece and have it in their home. It really has been quite a journey to be on and I feel like it's such a gift to be able to offer this work. What draws people to the work is as varied as the person who is approaching the work. For me, art needs to strike some sort of emotion, some sort of movement within a person. And I feel like that uh, I've been blessed with the ability to capture photographs that, that, that do exactly that. I've seen so many cases of that over the years, from, from, uh, from grandmothers all the way down to five-year-olds, six-year-olds. I've even had be moved by the work in really, really unique ways. My name is Joel Freemian. I'm from Northern Indiana. I've been perfecting a self-taught technique of fabric collage over the last 40 years. I began as a architectural designer and wandered into the fine arts. I came from a long line of fabric workers and eventually merged all my fine art training into this self-taught medium of collage. I've always had a strong interest since childhood in architecture, archaeology, so most of my works do have people and buildings in them. You know, my art, other than the medium, the subject matter is very traditional. When I was a painter, and I was a painter before I got into the fiber arts, I was largely a landscape painter. This process, though, being more of a building project, I wandered into still lifes, I wandered into city scenes, I've done portraits which I never painted. Because of the nature of the medium, I've tried all these things just as experiments in developing this new technique. And I found success with all of them. I used to be afraid to do portraits, now I love to do portraits. Never painted a still life, but I love this medium and the still lifes that I produce. So this medium has opened up a lot of doors for me that I don't think I would have entered while I was a painter. My works are comprised of discarded upholstery fabrics, leathers, suede, paints, markers, truly mixed media. I will use anything to get the effects that I want. And I was very good as a child at putting together complicated jigsaw puzzles. This medium is very much like creating your own jigsaw puzzle and I consider them small building projects. So it incorporates my thought process in architectural design with collage. When I'm setting up, it's always interesting because I've just in the recent past started showing them nationally. And as I've gotten out now and gotten into some larger towns, I'm realizing that my work is viewed as a completely new medium when I get it into a new marketplace. I'm very excited to come to St. Louis and expose St. Louis to my work. People are really intrigued with what I'm doing and it makes me excited to do more shows. I was delighted when I was accepted into this year's St. Louis Art Fair. I hope to meet you there this September and I hope to be back for many years in the future. Stop by the HEC Media Spotlight booth at the St. Louis Art Fair, taking place September 9th through the 11th in downtown Clayton. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Accurately diagnosing Alzheimer's disease can be a challenge. Upwards of about 40 to 50 percent of people are either undiagnosed or misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Randall Bateman is a professor of neurology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He explains a PET scan or spinal tap are used to diagnose, but the testing may be an expense and burden, possibly difficult for the patient and not easily accessible, so it may never get done. Without testing, doctors can't be sure, as other forms of dementia masquerade as Alzheimer's. And without a diagnosis, treatment options specifically for Alzheimer's patients, including possible advantages of participating in clinical trials, would not be offered. But there is an easier testing option. C2N Diagnostics in St. Louis has an Alzheimer's blood test on the market. A test that detects Alzheimer's disease amyloid plaques that uh, exist in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. The reason it's so exciting is that as a blood test, it's a very easy and accessible way for us to find people who have 
Alzheimer's disease pathology. Dr. Bateman is a scientific co-founder of C2N Diagnostics. The blood test called Precivity AD is a result of Dr. Bateman's research with Dr. David Holtzman at WashU. In a recent international study led by Dr. Bateman involving nearly 500 patients, the blood test for Alzheimer's disease is proven highly accurate. Three independent large national studies in different continents were all collecting blood samples and doing these PET scans, those, those red active PET scans to detect amyloid plaques, and also collecting cerebral spinal fluid through lumbar puncture. And the question was, how well the blood tests stack up to the more invasive spinal taps or the more expensive PET scans. And when we compared that, um, we found a few things. One is that it compares quite well. So we have accuracies of about 85 to 90, 93%, depending on how we use the test. And uh, also it was highly consistent across these different uh, groups of people in different studies, different collection methods. So it suggests that the test is robust, that you can use this test in a variety of different studies, different settings, and you get the same answer. He says when combined with genetic risk factors, the test is up to 93% accurate at identifying people at risk of Alzheimer's. When you measure the, the proteins in the blood, you can measure uh, amyloid beta, which is one of the proteins these amyloid plaques are made of. The plaques also consist of another protein called ApoE, and ApoE is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. And when you measure both of those proteins and you compare it to a, a sensitive test like cerebrospinal fluid, then it gets to 93% accuracy. These are tests of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease of amyloid plaques. So at any stage, which occurs years before people get symptomatic, all the way through the time that they have dementia and progressing, uh, this test would be positive it would show that the presence of amyloid plaques are there in the brain. Bateman says study results suggest the blood test can be useful in identifying non-impaired patients who may be at risk for future Alzheimer's disease, offering them the opportunity to get enrolled in clinical trials when early intervention has the potential to do the most good. According to C2N Diagnostics, any doctor who can prescribe medication for Alzheimer's and dementia can order the blood test, including doctors who specialize in memory care and primary doctors. And so that test is commercially available, and it's approved through a system called CLIA, which is a, a clinical laboratory approved test to be used in medicine. And so that's one of the approval steps. There are other approval steps uh, that it can be done includes things like uh, insurance companies reimbursing for the test or paying for the test. And that typically happens through Medicare and through other systems. And also FDA review and approval of the test to be used in the disease setting. And so that's underway also. So all of these things are going forward in parallel to try to make the test more available to people. Helping refugees feel at home later on Spotlight. You want to plant right next to here? EcoArt is artists calling attention to the climate crisis and trying to come up with actionable ways to improve our current situation. Uh, Taking Flight is an EcoArt project where I work with um, students to teach them paper making and print making, all while learning about pollinators. The paper that we make is actually embedded with wildflower seeds that we end up planting as part of the project. It involves a couple different steps. The first step is workshops with kids or adults where there's kind of education with the importance of pollinators, but at the same time they're learning hand paper making and printmaking. The students tear the paper egg cartons up into small pieces, then we put them in the blender, then we made a slurry, and then you scoop it up with a screen, and then they sprinkle the seeds on top to distribute across the surface. So it's just fibers like impregnated with seed, and then the rain will end up degrading it. They'll take the seed paper, they'll be able to actually plant it and have wildflowers grow. Excellent. Part of taking flight is that it feeds into the collaborative nature of lots of people making small efforts leading to big results. 
scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Most of the time, this section of Ferguson, Missouri is a food desert. But once a week, from May through November, this spot on West Florissant Avenue in front of the Boys and Girls Club turns into a fresh food oasis on wheels. The simple way of saying it is a, is a metro bus turned into a farmer's market on wheels. And we go to different neighborhoods selling groceries at a reduced cost um, in neighborhoods with limited food access. But I think the main goal is just to really make sure that the metro market is just like any other grocery store experience, that you have the items that you're looking for and you have a variety as well too. Fruits and vegetables look very fresh and below store prices. So, of course, that's always awesome. Although Metro Market is now run by Operation Food Search, its model is very different from its parent company. The model of OFS is, you know, the donation and then, also, and then the, the distribution to pantries. But the Metro Market works on a totally different model in that sense. So we're purchasing everything that is on that bus is purchased. So we go out and we work with vendors here in St. Louis and also in Illinois, too, to be able to source all the different things that are on the bus. Metro Market operates at locations throughout St. Louis City and County, Wednesdays through Saturdays with two stops per day. And while it's only been around since 2013, the need has only increased, especially since the pandemic. In fact, they expect to see more than 30,000 people this year. As we all probably have seen, <laughs> the uh, pandemic and everything that's happened has only exacerbated the need. So things that might have not been close to home for people before are now hitting more directly. So whether that's <laughs> the gas prices or just even just going to the grocery store, it's more expensive now. And so the need for the metro market is even that much more. It's definitely needed. Uh, we have definitely a lot of food deserts in North County, a lot uh, throughout our unincorporated St. Louis North County as well. And so this bus is a bus that is definitely needed in our area. That need and the benefit of being able to get fresh fruits and vegetables transcends beyond addressing food insecurity to the overall health and well-being of the community. It's really important to me as a physician knowing that we have programs like this to help our communities have access to the food that they need and that will help us better manage their care and better yet if we have more healthy lifestyles, those patients hopefully don't develop those chronic conditions and our community is healthier overall. All right, thank you. The Metro Market, yes, we're doing the work in the community. There's still a lot more folks that need to be fed. But at the same time, though, it is a community space. You know, like when you step onto the bus, you hear laughter, you hear joy, people sharing recipes and things like that. So I think that's another reason why people come to the Metro Market. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. On a sunny spring weekend, families come out in droves to area attractions like the Magic House. In this crowd of excited children and watchful parents is the Niazzi family. The family of 11 is larger than normal, and that's not the only thing about them that's extraordinary. They came to St. Louis from Afghanistan, fleeing the country when the Taliban took control in August of 2021. Tom Barrett is one of the first Americans the family met. Tom is a volunteer through the family partnering program of Welcome Neighbors St. Louis. We got the call that uh, the International Institute here in St. Louis was just overwhelmed with the number of people that were coming in and they asked for our assistance in getting some things out to the families. And so I immediately put my hand up the International Institute supports immigrants and refugees upon their arrival in the United States. Other nonprofits such as Welcome Neighbor St. Louis and Oasis International step up to smooth the transition. Immediately upon meeting that family, I said, I have got to get to know these people. Inamula Niazzi was a university student in Afghanistan. He tells yeah, us to I mean, call him Raja. My Inamula Niazzi is original name, but it's so difficult for you. I think Raja is easy for you. Tell me Raja, easy name. Raja is married and has two young daughters. Because job is important for me, for my son, family, and I want a job, good job in here. Raja's father was a high school principal in Afghanistan before being employed by the U.S. military. Like so many Afghan families, the Niazi family escaped with very few possessions. The Welcome Neighbor Family Partnering Program is there to help. They say, I need something you need, we help you. I say, right, really? They say for me, yeah, okay, no problem. 
went over and got them bedroom furniture that they said that they were going to need, clothing, winter coats. We see a need and we meet the need. Madeline Grusha is the Family Support Coordinator for Welcome Neighbor St. Louis. The program began in 2016 to help Syrian refugee families. We started pairing volunteers in the community with uh, the Syrian families, and we would say, you know, start your re relationships, live life together, celebrate life together, and then as they become independent and self-sufficient, you may pull away. No one can pull away because you're like, family, it, it's, there's no reason to let go. Even though you're just celebrating milestones like purchasing a home and watching the children succeed in school, celebrating birthdays, you're just like an aunt. So I have my own Syrian family. I've been with them for five years. We help them to get settled in here, but then we also try to become their friends. And uh, so much of what they're going to want to know is what is there to do in St. Louis? What are the things that kids can do? And so we try to just welcome them as a neighbor, a member of the family, and we try to help them to, uh, to learn to be with Americans and to understand the culture because we are very different from life in Afghanistan. Because there are so many needs, most families are assigned more than one volunteer. The Niazi family has four. Family partner Brooke Meadows says that it's especially important to help the women and children get out in the community. Just being able to get the women out of the house and um, we went to the dollar store on a little outing and then out to the park and I was able to provide artwork, uh, just watercolors for the kids and they loved it. They loved climbing on all the equipment. They really appreciated uh, being out in nature and just getting out of that confinement of the house. They're, the women don't drive. It can really become an isolating and confining situation for some to just be at home all day long and no career, just taking care of the children. So to be able to just kind of renewing um, experience for them. Like so many new immigrants, the Niazis are hardworking and resilient. Thanks to the family partnering program, they are able to take advantage of all St. Louis has to offer. That the, the people coming from Afghanistan are just absolutely wonderful people. You know, our cultures are different, and so, so we, it, it may take a while for us to understand each other, uh, but they are people who definitely want to be in this country, and it feels good to have people here who, who are know are going to make things better for themselves and their children. I personally feel that we're really benefiting more than they are, and I, I cannot even explain how much it's um, changed me as a person. You know, I was a teacher for 32 years, and I had no idea what having a relationship with a family from an, um, another country would do in, in this respect. I can't even imagine not having them in my life. Next week is all about the St. Louis Art Fair. Learn the history and meet some of the artists. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.